welcome to the final session. I'm very happy to welcome you to a dimmed quiet. Thank you to everybody for all the attention that you've given to talks and to questions, to other people's comments. And thank you for all the contributions you've made in organizing, presenting, uh, commenting and sharing. This session brings us to a slightly different tone, and I'm trying to set that by asking you to all sit quietly and just think for a moment over the last two, three days. And think about the word phone. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Maya Kuzmanovic and Nick Gaffney from Phone, of Brussels, but now peripatetic, uh, distributed um, mobile, foam, a transdisciplinary laboratory at the interstices of art, science, nature, and everyday life. It's some 10 years since I met Maya and Nick when they invited uh, a group from the University of Oslo, where I then was, into an uh, electronic art and culture project that was truly experimental with partners across Europe. A fascinating time of seeing their work in Brussels, where I met Maya uh, as a writer, a performer, a thinker, a leading thinker, a person who's led transdisciplinary teams in prototyping possible futures. Her work, I think, has been extraordinary over the years, with her colleagues working collectively, finding her own voice and sharing her knowledge and wisdom with others extremely generously. She's done this with Nick, a founding member of Foam himself, where he, in his own words, operates as a tangential generalist. He is, though, a designer, a programmer, a photographer, and a sous chef. These are remarkable people who have lived in the difficult spaces between popular cultural expression, state and private funding, collaborative, artistic, and scientific inquiry, and above all, a way to mediate their knowledge and share it with others, whether through meals, events, dream spaces, online blogs, or as we will have today, performative enactment. In one of their recent posts, Thriving in Uncertainty, they talk about the importance of the arts and the need for us, in a sense, to think about fellow times times of renewal, revival, and reassessment. Perhaps this is our fellow time today. And they say, they write, this field, the arts, has the potential to serve as a neutral zone where ideas can be prototyped, first as artistic or speculative designs, then as real-life labs implemented and evaluated in the wild, where the ultimate creative act becomes the radical redesign of everyday life. Welcome. Hello. Thanks for staying here. Such a long time. I'm not, I know a lot of you have to uh, take catch trains and planes, so I'm. Very grateful you're still here. Um, I'd like to start with a small meditative exercise of noticing. If you're sitting in a room, you are likely at least a little tired and a little saturated. You're aware that we are nearing the end of this conference. You're probably anticipating a talk, maybe some slides. Then some time for questions and answers. And what if this doesn't happen? What does this sense of anticipation really feel like? You can close your eyes if you like, or let your gaze wander. And just try to feel what does anticipation feel like inside your body? Is it perhaps a sense of restlessness or a fluttering, maybe a bit of a constriction in your throat or something else?
Just what, what is happening in your body as nothing is happening. Do you feel the urge to shuffle? Maybe your hand is starting to twitch towards your phone. Perhaps think, thinking back to your previous session or trying to remember what was that thing that I tried to say to that person who I just met and what was their name. Or are you listening and watching what other people are doing in the room? feels like you're wasting your time sitting here doing nothing. Or are you beginning to plan your journey home, like planning to walk to the train station, stand on the platform, anticipate a delay perhaps? here in a dark room anticipating nothing at all. Can you observe what's going on in your nervous system? Do you feel the need to move, to act, to leave? Or are you sitting comfortably, resting after days of incessant talking and information processing? Can you observe what scenarios are arising in your mind? Are we going to be keeping doing this for another hour? What will happen next? Now try to sense the anticipation of other people in the room. What does it feel like to be sitting in this room with dozens of people not knowing what will happen next and being aware of it? There are countless of possible futures appearing and disappearing every second in this room. Most of these futures are deeply rooted in your past experiences. As futurists are often quick to remind us to understand the futures, we need to look carefully into the past. So let's look at your past. When were you born? You can probably recite the date or perhaps even the exact moment of your birth. It's probably a time that someone decided to record. But do you know, was it your first breath? Your first cry? The moment when the umbilical cord was cut? You know, in some cultures, the moment your life truly begins can be months after you emerge from your mother's body. In others, your astrological sign is calculated from your conception. <coughs> Were you aware of anyone, anyone flipping a switch from not being to being you? Or was it more an experience of gradual becoming? What if we looked at the beginning of your life less as a specific instant and more as a process of inception? A hesitant process of contractions and relaxations a kind of pulsing and wiggling, rather than a clearly demarcated beginning. Moving on a bit, in the time since your birth, have you ever experienced anything with a razor-sharp beginning or ending? Or are most of your experiences trailing off into the past and the future? An unexpected sensation before an experience occurs, a premonition or an anticipation, 
or after an in intense experience, there might be after aftershocks of adrenaline, a sweet scent of pleasant memory, or the bitter aftertaste of remorse. Isn't everything always in the process of inception and subsiding? Some futures are already here, but evenly distributed. Some futures are already past. Or perhaps the future doesn't exist at all, and all we have is this, in, is this moment. And this one. And this one. And the next. Are you still here? Can you grasp this moment, the whole moment? In meditative practices, the moment can be measured with breath. A moment of in-breath and a moment of out-breath. So I invite you to watch your own breath for a few moments. It's natural rhythm. Now try to sense the different rhythms of inhalation and exhalation that exist in this room. Beginnings and endings of our breaths intertwined to form a whole moment. Yet this moment doesn't stop in this room. It extends infinitely in all directions. This moment and this one. And even though we're quite still, these moments also form a string of layered moments we perceive as the turbulent times of the present. The present moment, a dynamic space of operation where anticipation and action coexist in improvised flows. In the present moment, Donna Haraway reminds us, our task is to make trouble, to stir up potent response to devastating events, as well as to settle troubled waters and rebuild quiet places. In urgent times, many of us attempted to address trouble in terms of making an imagined future safe, or stopping something from happening that looms in the future. Addressing trouble might mean clearing away the present and the past in order to make futures for coming generations. But staying in the present, staying with the trouble, does not require such a relationship to times called the future. In fact, staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present. What does it mean to be truly present in messy, unfinished, uncomfortable situations? For some, it means finding ways to adapt to whatever happens, to be resilient. Resilient people bravely weather the storm and then return to a previous balanced state of being. For others, being present means identifying problems, then bursting into action to find elegant solutions. Yet many of our current problems are deeply complex. Problems that are very easy to state, yet very difficult to engage with. Often considered wicked problems, they have high stakes with no obvious and let, let alone elegant solutions. It sounds so exhausting to spend every moment trying to fix problems that will just shape shift into a, a different kind of monster tomorrow. What might be other ways of being present and staying with the trouble? In his book 2312, Kim, Kim Stanley Robinson suggests a pseudo-iterative mode of being. In a pseudo-iterative, one per performs the ritual of the day, attentive to both the joy of the familiar and the shiver of the accidental. We might consider this mode of being in the present as intense interaction between creativity and receptivity. Or we can des describe it in terms of action research cycles or Rosen's anticipatory systems, or as Tim Morton says, 
We are not looking for a compromised position between activity and passivity, but a whole new dimension that we might call wiggle room. Improvisation provides a good example of an experience that is both active and passive, creative and receptive, spontaneous and strategic. What is the role of improvisation in anticipation studies? Can improvisation help us experience possible futures in the present and at a human scale? As kind of rehearsals for futures that may come to pass, or in, as enactments of the possible. Does improvisation help us move from discussion and representations and towards embodied situations? How do we transform speculative scenarios from stories to experiences? Or in Rosen's terms, how do we consider a modeling relation for a set of situations? At FOAM, we have been exploring various ways to create examples of possible futures at a higher resolution than words and images. We began designing situational or experiential models that we call prehearsals or pre enactments After uncovering some key unresolved issues that an individual, a collective or an organization is struggling with, we sketch out a set of concrete scenarios, then prototype them as experimental situations. The prototype includes a backstory, a set of rules, a location and a time frame. But the characters and events emerge from the interactions of the people involved. The participants use their whole being to explore what it might feel like to be themselves in a speculative situation that could occur in their lives. They are invited to imagine who they would become and what their life would be like in this pre-enacted future and to act accordingly. As they experience a possible future together, they gain insight about themselves and about their relationship with others. This embodied experience helped to surface existing strengths and weaknesses, both of the speculative situations, but also of the participants themselves. We found that such situational modeling provides rich insights on both individual and collective level. The participants can use the insights to adapt and refine their anticipatory models. In a rehearsal, a model of a possible future can be inhabited, explored and shaped through observation and improvised engagement. In rehearsals, the model becomes internalized and then dissolved and challenged through actions, reactions and interactions. As in play and games, improvisation becomes a tool for both getting to know the world and shaping it. Knowing that the rehearsal is essentially an embodied model, the participants can use their capacity for anticipation and speculation to stretch what they see as present to what might be possible. As in any good improvisation, individuals' anticipation and action co-create the flow of the situation as a whole. Other people's actions become signals for others to reach toward, like attractors for improvising with. They are simultaneously witnessing, responding and creating changes in iterative cycles. In a rehearsal, like in anticipatory systems, the participants are conti continually updating the models from lessons learned. What's a model? A model is a work object, says Donna Haraway. A model is worked and it does work. A model is like a miniature cosmos in which a biologically curious Alice in Wonderland have, can, can, can have tea with a red queen and ask, how does this world work? So, how do we have tea with a red queen? We might not have a chance to rehearse for this tea party. And likewise, one of the defining features of wicked problems such as the sixth mass extinction, is that they are not susceptible to iterative trial and error. They cannot be reduced to a simple model. So you might ask, why then persist with rehearsals and stochastic tinkering? 
when rehearsals and other forms of experiential futures are practiced regularly, we are training our anticipatory reflexes. Like with meditation or martial arts, we become more intimately aware of our specific responses to challenging, to challenging and changing circumstances, no matter what these circumstances might be. The wider variety of futures we rehearse, the more we learn about our behavior in unpredictable situations. Through practice, we can develop aptitudes that can help us engage with complex problems. We are prepared to stay with the trouble, whatever the actual trouble happens to be. Imagine wanting to improve your map reading and map making skills. You're likely trained by looking at different maps or by making some simple maps yourself. It doesn't really matter what maps you're reading. It also doesn't matter if the map is exactly responds to the territory. It's the practice of reading the maps over and over again that is needed, needed for becoming a skilled map reader and maker. So if we extrapolate from map make, making to future making, the more we train our anticipatory skills, the more we can prepare for and navigate a wide range of futures and wicked problems. There is no end to rehearsing possible futures. Suddenly you might find yourself in the middle of the premiere. It's no longer a rehearsal, yet there is no ovation, just life unfolding. Rehearsals provide just one approach to finding some wiggle room in the present occupied by complexity and wicked problems. We've heard about many others in the last few days, so let's leave the talk on methods for the time being. Instead, let's look, let's look at what happens once we create this wiggle room. The present may become slightly unstuck, but not enough yet for you to leap into action. Instead, you can try to wiggle your way out of the problem. Wiggling combines alert passivity of keen observation with patient experimental action. Like when a predator becomes quite still before pouncing or walking across a frozen lake. You become aware of the existence of possibilities just out of reach. Slippery and exciting like soap bubbles. Wait for too long and they'll disappear. Try to grasp them too forcefully and they'll burst. So what if we would engage with the world as if it were made from soap bubbles? What if there is no way to be certain of one's decisions? Or, confident, or what if confident action becomes impossible? Or, it's Anna, or as Anna Singh says, what if precarity is the condition of our time? Or to put it another way, what if our time is ripe for sensing precarity? What if precarity, indeterminacy, and what we imagine as trivial are actually at the center of what we seek. Let me give you an example of working with precarity as a source of, as a source of creativity. For several, several years, we hosted something that we call transiencies at FOAM. It's a residency program for people and organizations undergoing major life transitions. Most of the transients were in precarious positions, usually following a destabilization of their, their status quo. A serious illness, pregnancy, burnout, consequences of political upheavals or difficult economic conditions. While the transients were still trying to grapple with their loss and trauma, their surroundings demanded to know what's next. Being part of FOAM's program provided them with legitimacy. A transiency allowed them to consciously inhabit the time of their transition without exactly knowing where they might end up. Similarly to rites of passage, the uncertain time of a transition has a long liminal phase. In this liminal phase, a person is separated from the certainty of their past 
and yet can't decide what might be the best way forward. In a society driven by solutionism, this phase tends to be cut short and often are overlooked. Yet, it is in the liminal phase that the transients tend to find most profound answers. In this phase, they are free to experiment with their true aspirations. While experiencing the precarity of the liminal state, the transients come up with their most creative, disruptive and meaningful answers. For example, one of the transients began her journey as an artistic director of a big Belgian cultural house. She came out of it after a year as a guide for rituals for unacknowledged loss. All we need to do is hold the space open for transition. We pro provided a context in which it was okay not to know what's next. Instead, we encouraged people to try things out, to come up with propositions and hypotheses and then test them in their own life. They began on a small scale and in short time spans, and then gradually expanded the scope. We guided the transients through the process that we like to describe as skirting the adjacent possible. <coughs> when you're not sure what the future might hold, shift attention to noticing what is already present. present. Watch for different possibilities to experiment with, Reclaim, reframe, synthesize and connect rather than isolate, reduce, fix and dissect. Dissolve rather than solve. Consciously inhabiting a life transition is a form of training for living with uncertainty and wicked problems. It gives you permission to experiment, to frame your purpose as a hypothesis, as a starting point, not an end point. In our accelerated world, as Beth Comstock says, we are best served by taking stock of our assumptions and transforming as many as possible into hypotheses. Thinking this way takes the pressure off because we don't feel like we have to know something that isn't yet knowable. We're free to let the future be the future. Approaching everything you do, including who you are, is a series of experiments opens up space for agency, for surprise, for being wrong, and for learning from mistakes, no matter how unpredictable and murky the situation might be. What is the role of anticipation in such an experimental approach to life? Anticipation contributes to the framing of intent. And why is intent important? Well, once you created some wiggle room in the present and explored some of this adjacent possible, you might want to see some of these possibilities manifest. How do you help the possibilities to materialize in the present? As we've heard in the last days, most worldviews and belief systems have ways of invoking the spectral possible. A prayer to St. Anthony might help you find a lost set of keys. At life's many crossroads, you could turn to Hecate or Papa Legba. At any moment, you might make an offering to Green Tara for protection or White Tara for good health. When in need of prosperity or success in business, best ask Lakshmi or Ganesh. Alternatively, you can follow the predictions of stock market gurus or the black art of economics. While the specific deities and invocation methods may differ, they all provide ways of focusing attention and framing intent. This is important because attention helps clarify the intent and intent helps build anticipation into action. It prepares the mind and it prepares the body. In the fields of observation, says Louis Pasteur, chance favors only the prepared mind. Could we consider anticipation as a non-sectarian approach to invocation? Anticipation shapes the perception of things that are already here to better notice the liminal things that might, that might be emerging. 
helps us clarify what is important in the noise of being. Anticipation isn't necessarily about invoking a preferred future, but it could be seen as a way of invoking appropriate actions. There are many forms an invocation can take, from burning effigies to writing a position paper or a mission statement. Each form has a particular voice that invites a specific response. Each form speaks to different sensibilities. So let's do a little experiment in invocation. What would the program guide for this conference sound like when framed as an invocation? Oh, materialized time. Oh, time of foretold futures and remembered pasts. We summon you across multiple timescales, beyond fictional horizons and in hidden utopias. We call on you, old time, to intertwine with power and freedom of social change. Open spaces of appearance, open unexpected ways of knowing, being and acting in the world. Oh, anticipation, come to us in times of unpredictable loss, while we witness the known orders destabilizing. Guide us towards re responsible behaviors and away from unintended consequences. Show us how to distinguish fact and fiction. Guide us towards truth. Help us govern the future in a time of crisis. Together, may we bridge anticipation, decision and action. May we pave paths for anticipatory governance, legacy and democracy. For the present and our experiences of it should not become stagnant or destroyed. May we work with people and work with uncertainty. We invoke anticipatory agency in the everyday. We invoke futures literacies for all. May we co-create a better future for humans, animals, and the planet. And through all of our serious pursuits, let us not forget to tell stories and play games. With our intent clearly framed, as you did over the last few days, you might begin to enter into a state of attunement. It's a state of alert but effortless intention, through which you can notice subtle resonances and synchronicities. Similar to what André-Marie Ambert described as a feeling around the realm of the invisible, or tatonban. In this state, a prepared mind is capable of recognizing relevant signals amidst deafening noise. It is as if you can turn down the volume of the world to listen to the voices otherwise unheard. Isabel Stengers calls this state an art of imminent attention, an empirical art about what is good or toxic, an art which our addiction to the truth has too often despised as superstition. The empirical art Stairs talks about is witchcraft. Witches, she says, are pragmatic, radically pragmatic, experimenting with effects and consequences, consequences of what, as they know, is never innocuous and involves care, protection, protection and experience. When it comes to working with complexity and wicked problems, you should not shy away from the craft of attunement, whether or not you consider yourself a witch. By tuning into different ways of knowing the present, a wider range of possibilities can become apparent. The space of attunement, says Tim Morton, is a spectral realm that is analog, thick, not rigidly bounded, so that more than one choice becomes available. The floating of decision in this spectral attunement is accurate and highly determinate. Morton's image of decisions floating in the attunement space is an evocative one. 
in contrast to the step-by-step -step approach of corporate foresight, attunement evolves through jittering and fluttering. Instead of the staccato rhythm of strategic planning, attunement works with a heterophony of resonances. From the acceleration of either or to the accretion of and, and, and. In complex and messy situations, it's not about making right or wrong decisions. It's about better or worse. It's about finding propositions that resonate with particular people and situations at this particular time. While attunement may uncover resonances that are already present, anticipation is needed to sense through the different, different pace layers of the long now, from rapid fluctuations of fashions to glacial movement of rocks. Anticipation allows us to select and connect an assemblage of propositions that are worth committing our time and energy to. Agnostic about where we're going, Anna Singh suggests, we might look for what has been ignored because it never fit in the timeline of progress. In this context, anticipation can be, can be seen as an ambient aptitude. An aptitude which permeates a collection of techniques rather than a single sharp instrument or a trademarked method. It's a soft form anticipation. It's akin to soft form martial arts like Aikido uh, as opposed to hard forms like Karate. This kind of anticipation is like soft improvisation with the potential versus hard combat against the inevitable. Anticipation is a metamorphic craft rather than a hard science. These forms of anticipation cannot be learned from books or lectures alone. They are acquired through embodied practice, repetition and reflection. So what does an embodied practice of anticipation mean? Noticing, attention, attunement and anticipation make possibilities apparent. By experiencing these possibilities, they become animated. An objective representation about anticipated events or their consequences is often too abstract. Representation can be too distant to instigate transformation. We all know about the inefficacy of communicating about climate change through graphs and statistics. This is not to say that words, numbers and images don't have transformative potential. Think of recipes, spells or love letters. They too use written and spoken signs, but in such a way that they gain the capacity to incite substantial transformations. Spells, says Warren Ellis, are nothing but poems intended, intended to write something new on the face of reality. The difference is that while a climate change graph is a representation, a spell is an invitation, a proposition to participate in an experience. The importance of propositions is not limited to matters of truth and falsity, notes Georges Romero. Language is used to evoke attention to features of the world that another person may be missing. Perhaps someone wants me to look up at the branch in a nearby tree. She has propositional feelings of a rare bird being there. Her interest may be in my entertaining the same proposition, but the most effective, effective method may be just to point with a certain expression on her face or to say, look quick, with some excitement. These gestures may lead to the result better than the sober statement, there is a rare bird there. As immersion of particip and participation increase, Responses to an experience become more immediate. According to Whitehead, experiences an event where differences between mind and matter, subject and object become indistinguishable. We have continual participation in the world, according to David Abram. 
we can suspend a particular instance of participation, for example, when your mind wanders while I speak, yet we can never suspend the flux of participation itself. So when what-if questions manifest, manifest in an immersive as-if situation, all of our senses are engaged and the experience becomes an animating force. A speculative experience can animate us in the moment, but more importantly, the visceral memory of an experience can reanimate a sense of agency and possibility long after the actual experience is over. So what happens during a truly engaging experience? Say when you are on a hike through a breathtaking landscape or making love or cooking or whatever else gets you truly absorbed. One thing that happens is that our experience of time changes. Change doesn't happen then in clearly delineated steps from one moment to another. Instead, experientially, change occurs by accretion, by shift and shattering. It's the accre accretion of a slow build-up, the gaining of weight, momentum and inevitability. Time, says Thomas Pynchon, did not so much elapse, but grow less relevant. What becomes more relevant in the flow of experience between is the flow of experience between you and all that is not you. The separation of self and other grows less relevant. You can experience the stickiness of not having an outside, not having a, a way to escape into. Time dissolves in a web of connections and ever-changing relationships. It's an experience of worlds that are overlapping and intersecting and interfering. Anything but separate, always entangled, always about to become. Working with experiential futures is less about imagining the next big technological breakthrough or plotting a profitable course of action. It's more about exploring the porousness and adaptive potential of human and non-human relationships. It's like prototyping a, a sympoietic system. Beth Dempster called the term sympoiesis from the Greek words for collective and production. She uses this to describe systems in which, in contrast to autopoietic systems, that are characterized by cooperative amorphous qualities. Sympoietic systems emphasize linkages, feedback, cooperation and synergistic behaviors rather than boundaries. Ecosystems and cultural systems are good examples. They are self-producing to one degree, but rely on the addition of new information as a source of adaptive potential. These systems are evolutionary and are characterized by continuing complex relations between the system's components. Those, though the systems have pattern and demonstrate a dynamic balance, they are inherently unpredictable. Experience is interconnected and entangled, unpredictable, and it can never be fully explained. There is always something that slips between words. A description or a model of an interconnected world does not encompass all the complex processes of making connections. <coughs> In order to honor this making of connections, says Isabel Stengers, to protect it against models and norms, a name may be required. Animism could be the name for this rhizomatic art. Against the insistent poisoned passion of dismembering and this demystifying, it affirms that it affirms that which they all require in order not to enslave us, that we are not alone in the world. In some languages, Mayan, Turkish, Japanese, and Tibetan, for example, relational nouns describe movements and relationships between things. So how could we make our anticipatory language liquefy, become unstuck, 
and mutate on the occasion. How do we communicate to connect rather than dissect? Could panpsychism perhaps reinvigorate freight connections with humans and non-humans alike? What if we took Carl Schroeder's idea of thalians as something more than science fiction? Thalians proposes that rather than us asking what reality is, reality itself can tell us. Could Thalians inspire us to create a different type of technological engagement with the world? How, for example, would we engage differently with emerging AI if we assume that they are capable of experiencing the world in a way that isn't comprehensible to humans, but is no less valid? How then can we share perspectives, assumptions and experiments with them? Similarly, how do we engage with a dwindling forest, a melting permafrost, or an out-of-balance microbiome? In animist traditions, when faced with the unknown, the intimacy of communing may be more important than the clarity of communication. In communing, the exchange is real, but not necessarily rational. It's real, but not always measurable. To engage with animism, notes Graham Harvey, necessarily involves being provoked to think more carefully about what it means to be a person. The understanding that persons always live in relation to others and in animist communities are regularly encouraged to act respectfully, especially to those one intends to eat. Animism is always local and specific. It might not be at all romantic, transcendent or esoteric, but might instead be quite practical or pragmatic as people negotiate their everyday needs. This gets to the center of what this talk is really about. Knowing that we are not alone in this world, how do we negotiate our daily needs and desires in turbulent times? There, of course, can never be a single answer. In our experience at FOAM, the beginning of an answer is, can be as simple as stop, look, be kind. These simple words remind us that under the surface of the frantic business of everyday life, there is a state of profound stillness and openness, which we can ac access even in most difficult of situations. Especially in difficult situations like life-threatening illness or an unexpected disaster, where uncertainty becomes the order of the day. Interestingly, when such situations are faced with equanimity rather than denial, fear gives way to empathy and solidarity. Solidarity, as Tim Morton reminds us, a thought and a feeling and a physical and political state seems in its pleasant confusion of feeling with and being with, appearing and being, phenomena and thing, active and passive, not simply to gesture to this non-severed real, but indeed to emerge from it. Uncertainty can appear much less scary when it is shared with others. Not just some others, but everyone. Human, non-human, animate and partially animate. Instead of walls and exclusions, we need more zones of conviviality and solidarity. We need to engage in ever wider ecologies of practices to participate in a proliferation of kinship networks across sectors and cultures. Never forget, we are all in this together. As this conference draws to a close, we invite you to anticipate how your work will increase enjoyment in the present. How will it increase our capacity to face, reimagine and transform intolerable circumstances? Not necessarily to overcome uncertainty, but to live with uncertainty and even thrive in it. 
We need structures to manage uncertainty, rather than attempting to impose certainty at the expense of catastrophic failure. While the sense of the moment may be one of accelerated change, there is simultaneously a drag, weight, and the inevitable delays of change that takes too long. Injustices perpetuated. We find ourselves in some situations without an escape velocity. Is this uncertainty we are experiencing just a series of erratic oscillations, or are we in the free fall towards something more massive? Things are collapsing, and sometimes the best thing to do is let them accept the gritty reality of it all. This doesn't mean giving up, quite the opposite actually. We have to find ways of surviving collaboratively in disturbance and contamination, calls Anak Singh. We need this skill for living in ruins. We no longer need grand narratives, but rather open-ended assemblages that invite different contributions. In uncertain times, we need deeply felt aspirations rather than dry statements of purpose. Instead of just tackling the big problems with the brightest minds, we need all of us to get our hands dirty with entangled problems and draw upon a wide variety of minds around us. This distinction is described evoc evoc evocatively by Ahmed, Ahmed Salman when he asks, is curiosity the archer's razor-sharp arrow piercing the bullseye time and time again? Or is curiosity more akin to an evolving sponge, devouring its surroundings, slowly morphing into an unparalleled, overflowing monstrosity? While the time, times we live in can appear disturbing and uncomfortable, in such turbulent times the world also appears more malleable. Things can more easily become otherwise. We have a chance to write ourselves into a future we want, says Anna Jane. Other worlds become possible. As Tim Morton reminds us, world is always spectral. World is the noise your behavior makes. World has a virtual modal quality about, about it that you can't delete. Worlds are partial objects like everything else. They are more than the wholes of which they are parts. If worlds are partial objects, then the linear part, path to a certain future spirals into unknown multiplicities. The purpose-driven, unidirectional, onward and upward of Prometheus gives way to Hecate's ability to see in dark places, to see in several directions at once. Futures unfold through convolutions rather than revolutions. Uncertainty ebbs and flows, with moments of intense upheaval, yet also unpredictable periods of quiet tranquility. Previously solid foundations appear porous and permeable. The gradual shifts of ecosystems, the acute tremors of natural disasters, the cyclical changes of seasons, chaotic weather patterns and unpredictable economies. Change is a constant, shape-shifting experience. It can be, can be an opening to explore different dimensions of the possible, a way to move towards a more heterogeneous, compassionate and imaginative culture. As we reach for words that might encompass the vastness of the unraveling now underway, write our friends for climbing the dark mountain, the great tide of loss that our kind has brought about, it seems that these are the words that come to hand. Whether taken up in a spirit of humility or of hubris, this is a language that speaks of ultimate things, of power, of loss and longing, of limits and the limitless. As we take leave of you today, we call on you all to keep searching, keep uncovering promising ways of viewing, being and acting in the world.
where continuity of human life itself is no longer certain. Create experiments, create outliers, create clearer views of the now. Anticipating change, hoping for change, or even fighting for change might not be enough. The idea of change itself might have to change. We need a hex for transforming transformation. A poem to write on the face of reality with all the force of our collective intent. And to end this talk, I'd like to try this force of our collective intent, if I may have your participation. So, I'd like you to think of one to three words that you'd like to contribute to our collective invocation at the end of this conference. It's, an, it's a poem of the Anticipation Conference. They could be words that describe what resonated with you during these days, something that you want to manifest in the near future. It could be your pledge or a word of gratitude to the people who have convened us here. So perhaps take a few minutes to write these words down and I'll let you know what we're going to do with them. Why? 